Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin building and protecting Michigan's critical cyber infrastructure, sponsored by Comcast Business. Please welcome U.S. Representative Mike Rogers. Well, good morning. You are the hearty of the souls, I see. You know, my wife and I had just enough wine last night and we thought we could dance. So I can see that maybe you, uh, at least half the crowd, partook in that as well. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. This is, uh, I think, one of the most important topics that doesn't get enough discussion. Uh, I want to talk about cybersecurity here for just, just a few minutes, about where we are and where we need to go. You know, right now we are in a cyber war and we're in it today. Thousands and thousands of times a day, we have both everything from hacktivists to organized criminals to individual criminals to nation states conducting acts of economic espionage to nation states attacking infrastructure and networks right here in the United States every single day, and it's getting worse. There are things that we can do about it, but it's going to take us, uh, I think, collectively to move there. And I want to talk about one case in particular and why this is so important that we have this discussion. It's called Saudi Aramco. It's a company in Saudi Arabia that was attacked, according to public reports, by Iran. And it was an interesting thing that happened there. So we hadn't really seen that capability in Iran uh, before. But what they did is they launched a very aggressive cyber attack over a period of hours that got in, changed data on their servers, manipulated data, destroyed data, and then destroyed machines. Over 30,000 computers became paperweights in a matter of moments. And that means you're not going to reboot it. You're not going to have some forensic guy come in and try to get something off of it. That data is gone, and you're not getting it back. Imagine showing up at work tomorrow, and over half of your machines and the data that's on them is just gone, and you're not getting it back. And then when you did go in and try to rebuild your system, you found that the data had been manipulated. In other words, if I owed you $100, it showed that you owed me $100. Talk about the nightmare, catastrophic. Now, it was caught over the course of a weekend in a matter of hours. And Iran would likely target a company like Saudi Aramco because it's the single largest uh, cash company that Saudi Arabia owns. It does all of their natural gas and oil transactions. And this wasn't the first time they hit Raz gas in Qatar. And here's what we know is happening today, according to public reports. They're probing our financial institutions. Now, they've hit us with something that is sophisticated, not completely sophisticated, but sophisticated enough, a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack, on our financial institutions. So you have a nation state who's not really a rational actor, who we know has better capability, probing for vulnerabilities in our in, uh, financial infrastructure. What would happen if they were successful in bringing down, say, a bank that does $8 trillion in transactions every single day for the international community? And now we didn't understand if they owed us money, or we owed them money, or we couldn't access it all. One of those financial institutions told us that just in lost transaction value and mitigation of the fairly low-level attack cost them $125 million. One attack, one weekend, a matter of hours. Think about what's at stake if we get this wrong. This is as serious a problem as I've ever seen. So we've introduced a bill, and I know Fred Upton is here as well. It was a, a great partner in this that did something very simple. About 80% of the problems we can solve uh, with very simple uh, solutions, and that's just good computer hygiene, right? If you find a thumb drive, if somebody gives you a thumb drive at this event, please don't take it to your computer and plug it in. It is the most common way to interject a virus into your computer. I mean, think about it. You wouldn't see gum on the street and pick it up and pop it in the old mouth, and, <laughs> right? Think of that. So that 80% of computer hygiene, knowing how to avoid phishing emails, people trying to get in your system using very clever ways to get into your secure networks, get around your firewalls, get around your password protection. But then there's about 20% that is the really nasty stuff. This is the stuff 
uh, that nightmares, nightmares are made of. This is the Saudi Aramco kind of an attack. This is what we could see that the Chinese are doing to us every single day with economic espionage at an unprecedented level. All of that's happening. If we could just share information, I, I'm the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. We do the 16 intelligence agencies, my job to do oversight for those and policy and, um, and kind of operational checkoff, if you will. So we beat on them every day to go overseas and get information that helps protect America. Well, they come back and they say, ooh, we found some really nasty source code. So we take that and we apply it to our government network to protect ourselves. Great, pretty well protected. We haven't seen some of this in the internet, but we know they have the capability, so let's protect ourselves early. It's against the law for us to share that same piece of information, even in a classified way, with the public sector, private sector, excuse me. So we can't give that source code to a company Verizon or Comcast or AT&T so that they can protect their networks. Why? Because we got it in a way that used classified techniques in order to collect it and we can't share it. So we said, why don't we do this? Wouldn't it be great if in real time, hundreds of millions of times a second, zeros and ones, the binary code and certain patterns, if we could take that information and share it both ways, because it is a common misperception that the National Security Agency and the CIA and the FBI are monitoring domestic net networks for content. Just doesn't happen. And so we can't, the government can't see what's happening in 90% of the networks in the United States, but they're protecting about 10% from what we get overseas. Wouldn't it be great if we could just share both ways about what's coming into our networks? Not content, not personal information, but those zeros and ones at 100 million times a second in a way that could allow us to protect from these uh, systems being vulnerable. Seems pretty simple. The House of Representatives agreed. We got an overwhelming bipartisan support. We hope to get some work done in the Senate here in the very near future, and I've had some good conversations there. But why, again, that this is um, really so important. There was one manufacturing company, and by the way, we're not immune. This doesn't have to happen in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. That's not all they're interested in. I mean, they are everything from pesticide formulas to brake pad uh, uh, design and construction. Uh, you name it. If it has some intellectual property value, they're going to try to get it. And there are just two companies left in America, by the way. Uh, those that have, uh, who have been hacked and, and know it, and those who have been hacked and don't know it. I mean, it is that bad and that prolific. Uh, I guarantee you uh, that your business, if it has any intellectual property or is engaged in a service that engages in the negotiation for any contract of intellectual property, uh, is vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. So if we can do this real-time sharing, we can get this part done, we think that we can take 90% of that top 20%. I know that's a lot of math this early in the morning. Uh, matter of fact, I'm having a hard time understanding it myself. <laughs> but that last, that 90% is a huge bite of the kind of things that causes a Saudi Aramco, preventing it here, and helps us stop long-term persistent threats from the Chinese. In other words, folks who are getting into your system, lurking there for a long period of time, trying to find the right files to steal, beacon back, uh, and run for the door. I mean, complicated stuff, but important stuff. And the good news is we have a solution. We're just going to have to work together to do it. There was some uh, disagreement about how we get there. Should the government mandate it? Can we do this voluntarily? Hopefully, we'll get to discuss that uh, in the panel. And I look forward to having a robust discussion on this. So if you've learned anything this morning and you want, want to walk outside the door, um, that, uh, as my wife said, the computer is the devil, is what you're telling me. Um, it can be. It's the most powerful engine for good. If we don't do something to protect the growth and economic uh, power and prosperity of, the, uh, of an open, free and open internet, shame on us. And the good news is we can do it, and we can do it in a free and voluntary way. It does not compromise safety, does not compromise your private information, and does not uh, compromise your civil liberty. So I look forward to having that discussion. Thank you for having us here this morning, and we'll uh, hopefully talk again real soon. Thank you. Now please welcome Michigan's Chief Information Officer, David Bean. Assistant Director of Computer and Information Science of the National Science Foundation's Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, and a professor at the University of Michigan, Dr. Farnam Jahanian, U.S. Representative Fred Upton, and Crane's Detroit business publisher, Mary Kramer. Well, good morning. 
I am so glad this is a morning session because if it were later in the day, I probably wouldn't sleep tonight. And I might, may not sleep either because this is scary stuff that, that was just described. We have a terrific panel this morning of experts, two from uh, the congressional scene who have a lot of knowledge about what's going on, and much of it is classified, so that is why you hear these public published report references because that, that clears what is already in the public domain. And then uh, at the state level, the CIO for the state of Michigan and Dr. Jahanian, who is at the National Science Foundation and also at University of Michigan. And Dr. Jahanian, I think maybe it would be great if you could start us out. And you, uh, Congressman Rogers already talked about some of the things that are happening, the Aramco, uh, Saudi Arabian situation. Tell us a little bit about the evolution of these threats and what, what is the, what's trending now. Sure, happy to. Uh, good to be with you. Good to be with you, David, Congressman Rogers, Congressman Opton. Thank you for everything that you do for Michigan and for the nation. Thank you so much. Uh, I, to answer your question, Mary, uh, if we look at information technology and how pervasive Internet has become, there's no question that these advances have transformed everything we do the way we do commerce, the way we communicate, entertain ourselves. It has changed so many industries. Uh, so when we look at the trends that we have seen over the past 10, 15 years, and Congressman Rogers alluded to this, it started in the early years with vandalism. Hackers who just wanted it to look good, so they wanted it to bring down an enterprise, a website, or the internet. But as we've seen over the last decade, we've seen the rise of cybercrime. And in particular, what we have seen is, as the global internet has gone through this profound transformation, we're seeing the rise of cybercrime where you see identity theft, you see theft of credit cards and so on that has taken off. Another trend that's, I think, important to recognize is politically motivated cyber attacks. And again, Congressman Rogers alluded to that. We've seen the forms of censorship, cyber war, activism, and in general, the rise of politically motivated attacks. But probably the most, most disturbing are two trends that have really come to surface, and we're seeing more and more of it, especially over the last uh, five years or so. One is cyber espionage, where the loss of intellectual property, uh, uh, these are essentially attacks that are launched against uh, government sector, as well as the private sector, as it was mentioned already. Think about trade secrets. Think about commercial data. All of that is being essentially uh, attacked. And, and some of it is being done by competitors, but many of them are being essentially launched by nation state. The final trend that I want to highlight, and I think we're going to get to this a little bit later during this panel, is as information technology pervades every sector of our economy, that means every sector is under attack. Healthcare, transportation, energy uh, uh, delivery, smart grids, uh, automotive sector, every sector is under attack. And that, to a large extent, if you want to see where the internet threats are going, just look at the adoption of internet and technology. Wherever the internet goes, wherever the technology goes, that's where the security attacks are going to go. I was speaking to the panelists before this session, and my number one to-do item when I get back to Detroit is go get some cash, have a stash at home. I mean, that, uh, that's what the, that was my takeaway. Congressman, you are you're, at you're, least tell us where you're keeping the cash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your committee, Energy and Commerce, is looking at. I would assume, the energy grid. What, what, where are you at that, on well, that? Well, we have uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, which I chair. John Dingo is a former chairman and active member. Mike Rogers, a, a good member, a great member of our committee as well. So we have jurisdiction over just about any, everything. But one of the things, of course, is energy. Uh, there's been a, a number of work. We've had a number of hearings. Uh, we've got some working groups. Mike actually is the co-chair with Anna Eshoo, a Democrat, in terms of a bipartisan uh, group task force that's uh, designed specifically to look at uh, telecommunication uh, uh, attacks as well as what can happen on the energy uh, grid. Uh, the uh, couple of different federal agencies are working with the utility industry to make sure that they have the resources to know if, if they're being attacked and, and what they can do and, and design to make sure that those don't happen. But the other thing that we've done is we wanted to uh, get out of the way 
of the House Intelligence Committee in terms of their legislation that, that they were able to produce. Uh, Mike and his ranking Democrat, uh, Dutch Ruppersberger from Maryland, really crafted strong bipartisan legislation that despite the threat of a real veto by the president, they were able to pass 18 to 2 uh, in his committee. Uh, they shared uh, with in top secret briefings with the entire House uh, and our leadership, as well as the Democratic leadership, urged all of us to attend at least one of the sessions that they conducted in a top secret uh, uh, way, uh, special rooms that, that he has, that Mike has in, in the Capitol, so that we could see firsthand the severity of the threats, what's going on, and what we can do to help arm our companies to dissuade uh, and, and to protect themselves from this information. And we had some non-believers that went into those meetings. Most of them were believers when they got out, which was why we were able, and I used to, I worked for the, the, the Reagan administration way back when. When you have a veto by a president, <laughs> It scares the willies out of your party if you're going to vote the other way. You, you shake at the knees. Mike's uh, committee, 18 to 2, more and more than enough votes to override a veto, uh, was very swift on the House floor, and we're anxious to see the Senate take that similar legislation up and get it so we can protect our companies in, in terms of what, what's, what's going on. What's the rationale for the veto? What, 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 what is the issue there? Well, we, we'd like to know. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, they, uh, they, there were five things that the White House wanted. We were able to give them three and move their direction on the other two. So not only was I a bit baffled candidly, I think so was my Democrat counterpart, uh, but we pushed forward. And the good news is if you were engaged in those briefings, and Fred was very helpful in all of that, uh, you can't walk out of that room. And my argument is if you see a problem, we're morally obligated to do something about it. And, and this is more than a problem. Mm -hmm. And when people walk out of the room, uh, to everyone's credit, I think they just decided, we're going to do the right thing. We'll let politics play out as it will. So some of the concern was this might be a little too big brotherish, but people were persuaded that there was a need and this was not an intrusion. Absolutely. We had, since the introduction of the bill, some 27 privacy clarifications in the bill. There is, if you, the bill's about 40 pages. There is more text in the bill of what you cannot do than you can do. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that pe if, if people don't feel comfortable with this, that it's not the government getting you know, your, your personal information or your, or your content. Um, so the IRS isn't involved at all? Thank God, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 Although they do want to see you about the cash in your <laughs> yeah. later. You know, somebody gave me a great description of this, if I can do this. Uh, you know, it's, uh, if you think of a, a raging river, and this is how I think most members came to their conclusion, an absolute raging river, and there is one plastic bottle in the middle of it. Obviously, it doesn't look like it belongs. So what your internet provider does today is it's looking for that plastic bottle, something that doesn't belong. All the rest of the water keeps moving, and so it pulls it out and takes a look at it, and about 99.9% .9 of the time, they're accurate that this is, there's something bad in this bottle. Well, what this does is takes this bottle, and it sends it to the, the, the government as well, because they're already doing this for you. They're trying to catch bad things already, your private. And, if, and what happened is we created a filter. When it hits the government, it strips out any personally identifiable information. And then we have four layers of oversight to make sure that after it gets beyond the filter, that there is no personal identifiable information. Once most members got through the fact that this is not about content, there's no keyword search, they're not getting your social security number, they're not getting your medical records. Matter of fact, none of that means anything to a, a machine that's operating at 100 million times a second, right? It's just certain patterns in the binary code. And so once we tried to break that down to where people could go, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then what we can do with it, by the way, it would go to the National Security Agency if it was originated in China or Russia or Iran, North Korea, uh, or the FBI if it was originated in Cleveland uh, or in you know, somebody's basement. Then it would go to the FBI for investigation. So that's how we got people to overcome this. And I think, candidly, I think there was more politics in the, and it was actually a, a veto threat. A staff would recommend the president veto a bill. And I'll tell you, if the president got this bill on his desk, I think he'd sign it. Dave, at the Michigan level, you know, I think a lot of big Michigan companies have big IT departments, big computers, but the smaller companies, 
I know you've been involved in creating something that I think is a tool that probably not a lot of companies really know about the Michigan Cyber Range. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what, yeah, yeah, what you've sure. been doing? So the Michigan Cyber Range, if, if you can visualize, um, it, it, the old uh, missile range or the old shooting range um, where you blow things up or shoot things and you go and do an R&D, right? You're doing research and development on it and you come out but with a better understanding. So the Michigan Cyber Range is just that, except we're using the internet. We mirror the internet, you know, and then we let, you know, we have companies come in, uh, and this is a public-private partnership, government, education, business working together, and they come in on the on the mirrored internet. It's air-gapped. It's 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 very secure, and you can put viruses on there. Can you, you can, tell us what air-gapped is? I think that's an important. It, it, so so it's it's actually taking, uh, it's it's actually taking the internet, uh, uh, mirroring the internet and having a secure environment. And, and then what we're going to do is put viruses on there. You can have the, the black hats, the bad guys coming in and hacking, and the white hats, the good guys coming in and, 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 and responding to that, that attack. Um, and in the, in the cyber range, um, we actually have a, uh, there's actually a community built within the cyber range that we're going to have an electrical grid in there. And so you can actually have companies come in and put their viruses on there and actually attack, do some, some major attacks. And then what we'll do on the and the ranges will respond to those. So it's really, it's, it, the, the range itself is the, the tool, right? But really what the benefit is, is what we're doing for the talent. We're, we're actually educating um, talent and, and producing talent in the state of Michigan. And we really believe that the cyber range could really be a foundation for uh, us building a, a, a significant cybersecurity industry in Is the that state up of and running now? And, and if so, how do people connect? It's, it's up and running now. Uh, Merit Networks out of Ann Arbor is the one who's hosting it. Um, and people can just contact the state, of, they can contact me at the state of Michigan or Merit Networks and they can get involved in the, in the cyber range. Okay. What um, David is getting at, echoing what, what he said, you see significant investment by uh, private sector as well as by state government, federal government, in creating essentially these test beds, these experimentation test beds that allow us to understand the nature of these attacks, understand essentially the vulnerabilities, and to be able to do, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of experimentation in a safe environment so you don't actually impact the actual right. internet. Um, but your point about workforce development is an important point that we shouldn't leave behind. Uh, there's no question that there's a whole economy is also being created around protection and mitigation and dealing with various kinds of cyber attacks. There's a huge, huge need in this country, including in the state of Michigan, to train individuals who can serve as security engineers, security analysts, managers in, in companies that understand information technology and security. So at the National Science Foundation, obviously, we're doing quite a bit of investment in research and development related to cybersecurity. That's one of the biggest part of our portfolio in my directorate. But education and workforce development is equally important. We cannot underestimate that we need to educate our citizens, of course, about good hygiene, as you alluded to, Congressman Rogers. But also, we have a tremendous need in this country to train technical professionals, engineers and analysts, who can work for the government sector, for the private sector, as well as a state government, of course, that would deal with these types of uh, security challenges that we have. I know and I should add one more thing, okay. is that state of Michigan, from where I sit in, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, these days, there's no question that under uh, Governor Schneider's leadership, the state of Michigan is way ahead of the pack. We recognize this as a problem, as, as being seen as one of the leaders in the country in dealing with cybersecurity issues at the state level. We, I just we like know that. just in, in an offhand discussion that we had with uh, Governor Schneider before he left yes. the stage, he talked about sitting in some of the, with the, with the National Governors Association, <coughs> sitting in discussions and talking about cybersecurity. And there are a number of governors that came in, they had no clue, what, and all of a sudden they got their rapt attention in terms of the, the real potential of a threat. And you know, we're, we're very grateful uh, that Michigan is where they are because we are way ahead of the game, particularly of the other states, but we, we all know that we've got places where we've got to go. And one of the things we're, from that National Governors Association meeting, We've actually invited all the other, other 49 states to come in and train on the, Michigan, on the Michigan Cyber Range as well. So I think they see the fact that we have a tool that everyone can use. And, and let's not create 50 of these. You know, it's an unclassified range. Let's just create one and let everyone use it together. So yeah, the governor's taking a strong role 
uh, nationally as well. So. Well, he's got that kind of computer nerd background, so <laughs> yeah, I, is that a big yeah. surprise? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I was listening to your remarks earlier, Congressman, and when you were talking about thumb drives mm -hmm. at this conference, there were people at the chamber with their hand over their heart because sponsors <laughs> provided those thumb drives. <laughs> I, I understand, I, I, but here's the problem, okay. is that you have no idea what's on that thumb drive. Mm -hmm. And it would be so easy to seed something in on a thumb drive and throw it in your gift bag, and your system is compromised mm -hmm. that fast. And you can even pull it up on a computer on a cyber range, and it looks exactly fine. It's a photograph of a, uh, you know, a dog playing at the beach. The problem is, in the back part of that, there is a virus that gets into your system. I went to speak at a cybersecurity event for people who do this for a living. <clears throat> So don't feel bad about this. Who do it for a living, and I happen to say, I want to see what your gift bag looks like. Now, it was the nicest thumb drive I think I've ever seen. It had a little leather case. It was a thumb drive nonetheless. You have no idea what's on that thumb drive. And unfortunately, you have to be that uh, conscious of what potential harm is getting into your network. And so all the firewalls, all your IT who, who build these fantastic firewalls and, and double and triple redundancy and security, you plump that thumb drive in inside your system, all of that was for nothing. And so it's that simple to get in. Uh, and so I know I love the thumb drives in your uh, baskets, but not really, remember. And when you get it home, I want you to think of that gum on the sidewalk and think, all right, I wouldn't put that in my mouth, I'm not gonna put this. <laughs> Mike, I don't know if you can tell this story, because I heard it in your meeting, but can you tell the story of those, uh, uh, the employees at the Pentagon who got that certain email? Do you remember what I'm Yeah, sure saying? do. Um, I, I, a couple of interesting stories. This is why this is challenging. It's challenging for employers as well, by the way. And you have a, the new generation that was connected by the time they were, you know, three months old. You know, they're pushing somebody's buttons on, uh, they can get on FaceTime now at three years old and do all of that. So there is this cultural thing that we're gonna have to fight going forward when it comes to security. But what happened was they sent uh, emails, and they were very clever, so they, uh, they being, it was a nation state uh, that was responsible for this, went through and found information on, on people's personal contact list. So they knew that, say, Mike Rogers worked in Section A in the Pentagon, they went and hack my home computer, because obviously how many of you have the kind of security you have at the Pentagon? None. So they went into your home computer and found your list of contacts, uh, and they took those contacts, and they went back and said, all right, but Fred Upton knows Mike Rogers, and I need to get in to Fred Upton. Uh, they found those addresses. They spoofed an email that said, hey, this is, hey, Fred, you need to see this. Open this up. This is fantastic, Mike Rogers. Well, I know Mike Rogers. This is great. So they call them phishing emails. Uh, they opened up the email and we had, uh, it was well over 400 machines. These are people who are trained against this, by the way. Over 400 machines infected. And once they're in your network, remember, once they're behind those firewalls, Katie bar the door. There's really no place they can stop. And so it, they have, they've grown even more sophisticated about how to get around uh, your your systems. Well, they even sent a, an email talking about your, you know, signing up for your federal, your health plan. Yeah, your federal health plan, which was another one. So they used that one as well, where they would open it so up. So you say, think hey, that it's legitimate and bingo, it's, it's like, done. They win. That, that <laughs> kind of gets to your point that we were talking about earlier sure. about why this is so difficult. Uh, keeping up with the hackers, I guess. And, and these are all great examples. I mean, on one hand, very simply put, Attackers and defenders are co-evolving. We're not dealing with the static systems. That's right. Because every time you introduce new functionality in our computing systems, in our applications, in our networks, and so on, you're potentially opening up new avenues for attacks and vulnerability. Also, we should recognize that you know, we take for granted, for example, some of the new technologies that we deploy, the environment that's changing. Everyone is talking about cloud computing these days. Mm. Everybody is talking about Mobile computing. All of you in this room, I'm sure, have smartphones hanging around. We have become so dependent on these technologies. But what we have to recognize at the same time is that as we deploy new technologies, as we deploy essentially, such as cloud computing and, and, and wireless and mobile devices and so on, that opens up new avenues again for potential attackers. One area that I think Congressman Rogers was alluding to has to do with social engineering. Um, 
uh, what, what I'm getting at is that this is not just a technology problem. If we view the cybersecurity problem we have as just a technology problem, we're going to go down the wrong path. Now, having said that, there's no question that, for example, the National Science Foundation, my directorate, invests heavily in R&D, trying to understand new techniques for detecting, mitigating, and responding to cybersecurity. But some of these techniques have to consider the fact that these are also social and behavioral issues. We have lots of great cybersecurity technologies that don't get deployed, and that's referred to as bad hygienes. So part of it, we have to address also the social issue. How do we make sure that all the great technologies that we're developing also get deployed and actually used? So usability, again, becomes a serious problem. A great cybersecurity solution that's not very usable does not get deployed. If it gets deployed, it gets disabled. Mm. And final reason for, for, um, um, uh, that I want to share with you in terms of why this problem is, is hard really has to do with the pervasiveness of technology. As technology pervades various sectors in the economy, we're becoming more dependent on information technology and networking in healthcare. We become more dependent on it in financial sector, in transportation, in smart grids, and so on and so on, and the state government, and the federal government, and the defense uh, industry. All of that means that uh, there are new applications, the new sectors in the economy that are depending on information technology that are going to be uh, 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 sort of vulnerable. Since we're, we're trying to scare folks, it looks like, I've got to share <laughs> you a story about uh, something that you would not believe that it's a cybersecurity challenge. It turns out since about, about around 2006 or 2007, the study shows about half of medical devices that are developed and are implanted, think of pacemakers, for example, have software in them, have programs in them. And we funded this study at the National Science Foundation by a number of researchers across the country, including some of our colleagues at the University of Michigan, that showed, in fact, uh, a significant number of pacemakers and defibrillators are vulnerable, as it turns out, to cybersecurity attacks, where you could actually take over a pacemaker and inject pulses that could be potentially fatal. That's an example that you would never, ever think that actually that kind of vulnerability exists. Same thing with diabetes, with the, Absolutely. With the, the insulin, the in, insulin with, with the pumps. So if, this, um, if the legislation that has been passed in the House and now is pending in the Senate allows for greater information sharing, is that required of companies? Or is that uh, companies can opt into a program of sharing those zeros and Right. It's, and the one. good news is it's completely voluntary. So when we set out to do this, we realized if we could have the high-tech industry of the Silicon Valley and the older, stodgy financial institution industry in New York agreeing on the same bill, we could get somewhere. And that had always been the problems in the past. They had a disagreement on how to get there. Well, we did that, and we, we were able to do that. And part of that was it really does need to be voluntary. You don't want to force companies to do this. A, some of them don't have the capability. But here's the good news. about. Ten providers have, of internet service have about 80% of our market. So in, this can ramp up very quickly because those companies would have the capability and they've all, all expressed interest in a voluntary way. And by the way, for that voluntary relationship, they get some liability protection for participating. Uh, they could do this relatively quickly. We could establish this uh, two-way communication on, again, just this malicious source code pretty quickly. We think within weeks, not months, uh, of getting the final sign off, these companies could start engaging in this real-time machine-to-machine sharing uh, that would have a tremendous impact. Um, that, that's that's the, a key part of it, though. It is, it's all voluntary. So people who didn't want to participate, don't participate. Should companies, though, be required to report to someone if they know they've been hacked? And, and, and I'm thinking there was a report in the Washington Post recently, within the last week, I think, that named specific weapon systems that had been compromised. There was a report in January, a government report, that said a number of weapon systems had been hacked or compromised. Um, and then the Washington Post got the list of exactly what those systems were. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? They have public. That the Washington Post got the list? I think that's a bad thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> as the intelligence guy who's supposed to be able to you know, keep that stuff safe. Um, I'm not sure it's a good thing. What, 
the problem when we first started this, we had the a hearing, I don't know, maybe two, two, two and a half years, maybe three years ago now. We couldn't find a company that wanted to come in a public forum and say, oh, by the way, we've been hacked. We could not find a company to do it. Now, the line around the Capitol building to come in and have both classified and confidential conversations would have gone from Washington, D.C. to California uh, of the numbers and people wanted to talk about it. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little torn on this both ways. The SEC has, has now has a, a, a reporting requirement that if you have been hacked and lost a certain value of intellectual property, you have to report it to the SEC if you're a public company. Probably the right thing, except it's, you know, you can drive a truck through it. And at the same time, you do not want to advertise to your adversaries that you have weaknesses in your system. That's a disaster for you. That is a, you know, that is, uh, that is a magnet for trouble. And so I argue you've got to have a combination of both. You have to have the ability to keep it secret so that you can change and mitigate in real time. And you probably have some requirement if you've had such a huge intellectual property theft loss, which will impact the value of your company, to report that if you're going to be on the market. So I think they've, they're trying to still find, I think, what that, what that right combination is. I'm not sure we know it yet today. I think there are already um, uh, laws on the book, I believe, that if personal information is stolen right. from a company, it has to be reported. Personal. In other words, if your credit card information is stolen yeah. because somebody hacked into a network or a computing system uh, of a company that you had uh, business dealings with, then it has to be reported. I think the issue of import information sharing, there's no question, it's very, very important. Uh, and, and what we really have to recognize are, are some of the issues that you alluded to, Congressman Rogers, having to do with privacy issues. We need to make sure that folks understand that you can do information sharing without violating individual rights, without violating individual privacy issues and so on. Uh, and furthermore, um, I should tell you, based on my own experience, um, having launched a company in, in the cybersecurity business, which is based in Michigan, by the way, Arbor Networks, uh, 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 many years ago, uh, I can tell you that there is tremendous interaction also takes place among essentially the private sector participants. The internet service providers are extremely good in sharing information. They've come a long way over the last 10 years to do that. Also, the financial sector has done a terrific job of sharing more information related to cybersecurity. What, what we really need to do is to make sure that there's a concerted effort involving the federal government, involving the private sector, as well as the state government, in timely sharing of information, such that during a time of crisis, we're ready and able to respond to those types of issues. Dave, you've got some kind of uh, advisory group of yeah. some of the largest, you want yeah, so we have something called the, the Kitchen Cabinet. It's, a, it's some pretty large companies and, and smaller companies from Southeast Michigan that I meet with on a monthly basis. And the two, two main topics we talk about are cybersecurity and talent. And we, one of the, around cybersecurity, we asked our, our chief security officers of each of those companies to get together and start putting together what we call a cyber disruption plan. You know, how can we work together? If something was to happen significantly in Michigan, how do we come together? And we'd be working together with the public sector, right? And I got to include the National Guard in that because I think they play a significant role. The federal government, you know, and then the, the, uh, the private sector companies that I work with. How do we come together, share information, and almost, almost in uh, uh, almost mutual aid terms, too. How do we get together and help each other out? So, so there is a industry, plan? You've got a, you've got a, not a doomsday plan, but you've got a plan in place? We got a response case. plan. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's a work, in, obviously it's a work in motion, but uh, it, 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 it just goes to show what, what, what Farnham was saying and what the congressman was saying too, that people are coming together and working on this together. Yeah, uh, but to it, prepare for this, for this panel, I was reading, you know, scanning a lot of different things, and I was reading stories about how certain countries have created a talent base by trolling the hacker conferences that are government sponsored to, to identify the best talent and get them involved in attacks. Do we, I mean, do, where's our farm team? What are we doing? Yeah. Well, some of that does happen. The private sector does that well. The government does, they have some. I think the Air Force was the, one of the pioneer services that went out early and tried to do some of these uh, hacking uh, contests. I got to tell you, I, I, I hate the notion of saying we want people to come in and ha have fun by hacking into someone's <laughs> system. We are absolutely reinforcing the wrong thought pattern here. But at the same time, we have to attract that young talent uh, to go on to the defensive side. 
Um, and it is hard, and we're trying to do education programs now that we can seed in. All of the military service academies now uh, will have a cybersecurity major. That's the first time it's, it's a huge departure for our military academies to have that cybersecurity major. So we're trying to get that next generation ready. And the good news is for about uh, the, the National Security Agency, by the way, which is the best in the world, uh, and some of the stuff that happens there just can take your breath away about how good they are. Uh, they'll get 40,000 applicants for about 400 positions a year. So the good news is they do have a talent pool to pull from, uh, but that next generation can't just be geared toward the National Security Agency or just our military. The private sector needs these folks as well, and that's where we have this shortcoming. I, I think these conferences are good. I just wish they'd change the way we talk about it. We don't want to encourage people to practice hacking before they show up. Uh, lest they might be successful. Uh, yeah. With respect to uh, uh, workforce development and training, there, there's a program that I wanted to share with you called Scholarship for Service that Congress is very, very supportive of, bipartisan support for this program. And the idea behind it is that we, from the National Science Foundation, give scholarships to individuals who get their undergraduate degree, masters, and in some cases, PhDs, with specialization in cybersecurity. This is an extremely popular program. We've been running it since about 2007. Uh, tens of millions of dollars have been invested in this program with support, bipartisan support from Congress. And I can tell you that over the last just few years, uh, 1,800 individuals who've gone through this program. And as part of that, they do a one or two year service in the federal sector or the state sector. So there are creative programs at the federal level that support training of cybersecurity professionals. And this one in particular, Scholarship for Service, is a very important one with a great track record, terrific track record. Now I'm assuming that um, many of the folks in this room, they're not, they are not CIOs, but they might be owners or executives in small to large companies. Based on the conversation today, what are the one or two things that they, going back, back home, what are the things that they should be thinking about and asking about in their own companies or organizations? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Well, yeah, I'll start. I think um, what the congressman was saying, was, or congressman was saying earlier is, is really important. The 80% the, the of the cyber, cyber attacks and, and the phishing scams, all those kind of things, can be resolved with basic cyber hygiene. So those are the things that I would tell. When, we talk, when I talk with small companies, small businesses in Michigan, I tell them, Look at the basic cyber hygiene. And we have on the, on the state of Michigan site, michigan.gov, we have a, a toolkit that has you know, basic, free, in downloadable information that they can go in and they can implement in their companies. I think that's really, really important. Um, and I also got to put a plug in, too. The education pieces are so important around cybersecurity. And I'm not sure we're doing a good enough job educating our kids. I mean, I have three beautiful kids. They're 11, 10, and 7. And quite frankly, they're not probably, and I'm the CIO of the state of Michigan, right? I don't think I'm training them well enough, educating well, them well enough. Well, kids want to share. It's all about sharing. Yeah, and I mean, they're on all these smart Cultural devices. Yeah, yeah, we need to educate them. We need to educate them soon. But um, the basic hygiene, I think, is the most important piece when you talk to, when you go home, say, let's, let's look at our, you know, our antivirus, and, and let's look at the things that we can do very easily, very inexpensively to protect our environments. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I, I mean, I uh, agree with it. And, and know that just because you are not a company that you don't believe that someone would be interested in is a serious mistake. Uh, I'll give a great example. We were up in New York. There was a small uh, investment company that showed up. We were having a, a cybersecurity discussion. Uh, and so one of the guys there, has, it was at about a little less than a billion dollar fund, which is small in Wall Street standards. Uh, and he said, I, don't, I, I thought this was all a you know, waste of my time. Nope. Who was going to be interested in my small uh, VC uh, fund? So he hired a, com uh, a company to come in and do a forensic uh, evaluation of his computer system and found that the Chinese had monitored every single transaction he had done for the last two years. Wow. Think about that. I mean, it's shock is breathtakingly shocking. Uh, and so part of it is just be aware that you, ha you are responsible for at least having a security system that you can uh, operate in your, in your, uh, on your own system. And if you are connected to the internet in any way, you are vulnerable. 
and most of that 80% of your operators are, are, you know, at some point during the day will do something personal on, off of your, your network. That's just the way it is. And we've, we've got to understand that. That is a huge vulnerability in your system. So starting to educate, to me, is the biggest thing we can do. And it's not just users, it's CEOs of these small and mid-sized companies, uh, which uh, Chairman Upton and I are doing this uh, uh, supply chain risk evaluation. We're doing a, we've started a, a small comp, because that is where even our big defense contractors are vulnerable. You know, people they buy screws from are connected to the internet and are connected to their ability to, to uh, have a discussion no, you wouldn't think a screw is, is anything we all, you know, who, who's going to be interested in stealing the blueprints for that screw? Well, they'll use that company's vulnerabilities to get to the next company's vulnerabilities to get to the next company's vulnerabilities to where they get to where they can steal the mother load. And they're very patient about it. And so just that whole education piece mm -hmm. is important and understanding you do have a responsibility to have security on your networks. Uh, I think that's critically important. We've got about three minutes left, so in closing, I wondered if each of you would like to just, any point that we haven't covered, anything that you think is worth uh, highlighting, even emphasizing something, another point that we, that we had made earlier. Congressman Upton. Well, look, let me just say, you know, just before Easter, uh, South Korea's uh, system was attacked. Their financial system was attacked. Their broadcasting system was attacked. It literally shut it down for a whole day. That prompted a lot of discussion within our leadership in, in the House to say, what, what's going on? What is it that we can do? We need to get Mike's committee uh, up and running to get this bill done. Literally, the first week that we were back after the Easter recess, we moved the bill on a very strong bipartisan basis. Mike and I were part of a, a, a world conference uh, down in Georgia, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, CEOs from all across the country, I don't know, four or 500 people that were there. This was one of the number one issues. Uh, we had a number of senators, we had leadership from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, and the senators that were there all said, we've got to get this legislation that really solves 85, 90% of the problem through the Congress, so we've now done our job. So last month, April, April, we got this thing passed, and we just gotta hope that the Senate takes it up very quickly, maybe iron out a couple differences between the House and the Senate, but we're at risk. We're at risk in a real serious way today. And the longer it takes for us to connect the dots to try and uh, block this, uh, you know, what could be catastrophic happening, um, it, it's, it's on our watch. We gotta get it done. Any other last thoughts? I would just want to add a couple of points. One is that we absolutely need to continue our investment in R&D in understanding, un uncovering, I should say, and addressing underlying cybersecurity gaps that we have. Uh, we need to focus on root causes rather than on treating symptoms, which is most of what we do today is we're trying to deal with symptoms, as I understand the root causes. Attribution is becoming a huge, huge problem. I think Dr. Congressman Rogers and Optin both alluded to this. Being able to trace to see where this attack is coming from to be able to stop it, which brings up the import, important, important issue of information sharing. Also, the other point that I want to stress is that uh, let's not forget that we need approaches to cybersecurity that are multidimensional, involves technology, involves variability, human and institutional motivation and behavior. So whatever solutions we come up with, it has to consider both technology as well as behavioral and social aspect of it. And the final comment about this is that we really need to be proactive about things. We cannot be reactive. And I would say real quickly that, you know, we are in a great position right now as the state of Michigan. We have great representation in Congress. Um, we have a great governor, Governor Snyder, who really gets this. Mm -hmm. And it's a very serious issue. And I think we, if we can all work together and work with the federal government and, and, and you guys, I think we can do some real, I think we can do some serious, serious business here. Now, Congressman, we have about 20 seconds left in case you want to make any other yeah. big <laughs> announcement. Yeah. <laughs> any other big announcement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My wife and I will be having lunch later here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know that's big. I, I will tell you this on the internet. It's one sixth of our economy now. And why this is so important and why we have to get this right is if we want a free and open internet that continues to drive our economy, we have to do something now. Imagine if you lose confidence in the fact that your bank 
can keep and hold your money and tell you how much is in there, or if for whatever reason your, your personal mobile computer is compromised and uh, somebody rips you off. If we lose confidence in the ability for the internet to, to be a part of commerce, we will lose dramatically the economic innovation that comes with one-sixth of the economy. That's why I think we're all so concerned about it and why we need to get this right and we need to do it right now. Thank you and Thank thanks you. to this terrific panel.